Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise Him in Jesus' name. Before we begin, I want to welcome everybody to beginning tonight our lessons in marriage and parenting and finance and holiness. In case you're wondering, this is what we're going to be learning out of. It's a good outline. We've been through this before, so it's the same thing. But I want to start out with what better marriage to look at than the marriage of Adam and Eve. They were the first ones to fail at marriage. And think about that. They were fresh out of heaven. They, were, they had a perfect union with God. They were in the land of Eden, the Garden of Eden. And they still failed. What does that say about our marriages today? Without God, we don't have a chance. If Adam and Eve can fail, but that's where we're going to start next week. I want to start with the first married couple, Adam and Eve, and we'll take a look and see where they went wrong. And we can pick up some things that they've done that we we don't want to do. And point out some things in their life that they've that caused them to trip. And where it all started. We'll see where it all started. And see how they ended up where they were at. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and begin. Let's all pray. Let's all open our hearts and our and ask God to speak to our hearts and our minds and let Him move us and stir us and touch us and change us and give us a, a new understanding of His Word and just tell Him to speak to your hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, Lord, we come before you. We ask, God, that you would teach us and that you would help us learn, help us to understand your word, and help us to share what you would have shared among your children. We ask, God, that you would restore everything that may have been broken and relationships in spouse between spouses and even in our marriages amen as long as you we include you in our marriage we have a hope amen you said you would give us love you give us power and you give us a sound mind we ask God that you would help us develop our sound mind through this lesson and let it produce love and power in our relationships, in our marriage, in our unions, and even in our vows in Jesus' name. And I ask you, Lord, to help me teach your word and just like to use even that donkey in the Bible. Let me be that animal and use my mouth and my tongue tonight to, in Jesus name Amen Praise the Lord Greet your neighbor for shake their hands or do the chin up thing however you greet but tonight is just a kind of an introduction kind of 
introduction kind of lesson to get my feet wet to trouble the water some and see who all shows and see who everybody here expect to see through every lesson amen and i hope by the end of the lessons we have a full house of, of rededicated and recommitted and uh, spouses amen i'm learning right along with all of you amen as I'm not saying my marriage is perfect. It's on its way to becoming perfect. Amen. But I've come a long ways. I want to start out with a verse in Mark chapter 10, verse 6. It says, From the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father his mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so then they are no longer two but one flesh therefore what God has joined together let not man separate my wife and I have been married is it 26 years we've been married 26 years but we've been together about 30 years. Well, that's a miracle. We shall, we should all just roar and ovation. That's a miracle. 30 years in marriage. You hardly ever hear of that. I mean, there's other qualified married couples, I'm sure, in the house. And got Brother Jackson over here. They have 40, 50 years ongoing. And some of you've got good marriages you, you could be standing here and teaching amen but we've come a long way and even now I think I'm finally beginning to realize who I am and what I am and just recently I discovered that I'm an archaeologist because the older she gets the more excited and interested I become. <laughs> and in a marriage, in our marriage, I try to be funny sometimes. Crap jokes, I'm kind of a joker. But sometimes she doesn't, seems like she doesn't understand my jokes. And I think she can't even take a joke. But then that's when I remember and say, hey, she took me in. But anyways, and it's true what you've been hearing the last couple of days. Bishops coming up here and saying marriage is hard, and that's very true. What you've been hearing about marriage lately is all true. It is not easy. My wife and I have gone through many patches, many rough areas. It's been mixed with good and bad. And looking around now, marriage is not for the faint of heart or the weak at heart. Marriage takes real work. Marriage takes real love. Marriage takes real patience. Marriage takes a lot of work. Marriage is a real commitment. It's a dedication to your marriage. You have to dedicate and commit with all your strength in order to build a lasting, loving relationship. Even, even if God did send you that person that you've been praying about, there is still going to be some work that has to be involved. Because remember what the Bible says, there is no one that is perfect. Not one. So if you're single tonight, or maybe you're married, to me, I think marriage is worth pursuing for a lot of reasons. Not just saying that, don't, don't go running out and getting married now. <laughs> I think it's worth pursuing because once you involve God in a marriage, once you include God in all of your plans, in your family, your spouse, your kids, once you get God involved, 
And once you begin to, once you invite God to be a part of your marriage, your marriage is no longer in vain. Building your marriage is no longer in vain. Working at your marriage and suffering in your marriage is no longer going to be in vain. Remember the Bible in Psalms 127, it says, unless the Lord build the house, those who build it labor in vain. What does vain mean? Vain means to be empty, or vain means emptiness. So labor, labor in emptiness, work at nothing. Your works and your labor and your efforts are empty, unproductive without God. Without God, your labor is wasted. It's a waste of time without God. Because it's not being built the way God wants it built. It's vain. It's empty. Unproductive. Without God in a marriage, a marriage gets boring fast. Without God in a marriage, a marriage dries up quick. Without God in a marriage, there's no fruit. There's no joy. There's no love. You may have put already together a house or a home, but without God, it's empty. Amen. So I think it's worth pursuing because God, when God gets involved, when you include God, going forward after you do that, then that's when you realize and then you see God has put you together for a reason. Then you begin to realize and notice, hey, I'm with this person because God has put me together with him or her. And now you begin to see and realize that there is a greater plan that has been put in place for both of you. Once you include God, you begin to realize that there's a greater purpose in your marriage, a bigger plan that God has set aside, bigger and greater beyond whatever you thought. If my wife and I would have given up, we wouldn't be sitting in this building tonight. We wouldn't be, we wouldn't be here tonight. We wouldn't be in this building. I wouldn't be teaching tonight. But through our marriage and our union, God had a purpose. God had a plan. And here we are today. Amen. I thank God for that. He had a bigger plan. When you include God, your marriage becomes full and productive. All your laboring that you're putting in and the suffering and the enduring that you have to do with your spouse, now it's not in vain, but there's a reward, amen, at the end. With God, your marriage produces fruit. With God, your marriage becomes a living testimony. With God, your marriage becomes a testimony. With God, your marriage is not empty or boring or dry. Your marriage has purpose. And like our Sunday lesson, it says God drives us to a desired end result. What He desires, what He wants, what He wants to accomplish through you and your spouse. There's a plan. There's a reason why you are together. Amen. Have you discovered what the that purpose is in your marriage? Have you seen the plan that God has set for both of you? Have you seen the ministry and the calling that's been placed on your lives? Amen. I want to commend those that have been married 30, 40, 50 years. 
I think they deserve a round of applause. That's a lot of work that's been put into being together for that long. Amen. We can be encouraged by, we can even go to them and ask them, uh, ask what they've done or how they've done it. Brother Jackson, maybe Sister Jackson and others. Amen. There was a time even in my marriage, in my life, that I didn't include God in our marriage. And I didn't even realize I was doing that. Even though I went to church, I was doing all these church things and being involved in church, but I didn't realize that I wasn't including God. God was fully involved in my marriage. How? Because my priorities were out of whack. They were out of line. I needed to change a lot of things with myself in my life. I needed to rearrange and realign my priorities. Only for that reason, God was kind of distant in my life. I didn't put Him number one. I didn't pray. I didn't, you know, I, I prayed. I prayed, but it wasn't about, you know, my, my purpose or my plan. I think I was selfish in a lot of ways. I was unsensitive. I was rude. I was bitter. I was angry all the time. I was mean. I was unloving. And I know it's really hard to see it now. I know you can't believe it. But yes, I was that person. Just ask my wife. I was one jacked up or messed up joker. I was messed up. But through all those rough patches, through all that junk that I put her through, divorce was never an option. We may have threatened each other with divorce, but in the back of our minds, her and I knew that was not ever going to happen. It was not an option. Maybe murder, <laughs> but never divorce. <laughs> I have learned some lessons. I know my wife learned right along with me. We both learned together. We were faithful in our marriage despite what the enemy tried to do despite all the stuff that he threw in our marriage to cause us to lose love for one another, to lose hope and faith and just give up and quit doing it. He had his attack on our, on our marriage. Some of those lessons that were learned, or part of those lessons that I learned was learning who my wife was. That was number one, I had to learn who my wife was. I had to try to understand her. I had to try to figure her out. I did just things her way. And her way always made sense. Her way was always the wiser way. And that's what females have over us, men. They just automatically know, and I've noticed, I speak out of experience of this, my way was always a foolish way. My way was always to get angry and bitter and upset and mad and, and to be unself, or to be selfish and unsent, insensitive. But she always, was right in everything that she did and planned and and it's hard to admit that and it was true I got angry at times because what she was saying was the truth 
She saw things from a totally different planet. And I only recently had to learn how to be sensitive. Only because I've seen her sensitive side. I have to, I have to, I guess you would say, afflict that side of her life and her, her reactions, her sensitivity. I had to learn how to be sensitive to that area in her life. And I had to learn how to listen because I was selfish, like I said. It was all, all about me. I never realized that I was blind to the thought of me thinking about my, my hurts. I didn't understand. I didn't know I was doing that. But it was always me, my hurt, or my pains, or my sufferings, or my past, or my mistakes, or my wrongdoings, or my healing and my needs. It was all about that. I had a hard time discovering that. I had a hard time seeing that. And a lot of men I know are trapped in that. There's things they know, there's things in their lives. They know there's some clutter and some junk in their lives and they know it's there. But for some reason it becomes so small and insignificant. Only because we haven't set it out on the table for us to both uh, deal with. It wasn't until I, we dealt with some of my issues and some of her issues. And, that, and that's all it takes when you discover it and you set it out on the table for both of you to recognize. And that's when the healing begins, when one admits, hey, you know, I, I do have trouble with this and this is where I went wrong and this is... That's all it takes. But our trouble continues in our, our relationship, in our marriages, because we don't deal with small issues. We don't deal with little things in our, in our marriages, and that's what causes disruption. That's what causes us to overlook all this little stuff. But I had to realize that. Like I said, I was messed up. I had, I had all this stuff in my life. Only until I brought it out and I had to deal with it. And that's when our marriage took a different direction. Amen. Through all that muck that I put my wife through and the junk, she believed in me. How many of you husbands have a wife that believes in you? Even though I hurt her and I said things and I've done things and she believed in me. Through all the stuff that I said to her and done to her, she always told me that she loved me. Through all the places that I've drugged her through, she waited for me, always was faithful to me. She was patient, loving, enduring, supportive, and most of all, she was strong. She was strong enough to put up with my junk. We ought to be thankful for our wives. Amen. They put up with so much. They deal with a lot of issues. Amen. So I'm thankful for my wife tonight. She's strong. Women, a lot of you know her. Amen. She's strong not only physically, <laughs> even mentally, emotionally, psychologically. And that's a lot to say about my wife because it's true we've come that far. Our relationship was not not even a 50-50 involvement, and, and it was a hundred and hundred to ten percent involvement. And I heard her talking to someone one time, and she was saying, it's not a 50-50 involvement in a marriage. She says it's a hundred and one hundred involvement between spouses. 
Amen. But really, I think it's a 200 and 200 percent involvement between spouses. Amen. But I do appreciate my wife tonight. We've come a long way tonight. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. So men, husbands, and even boyfriends, value your spouse above all else in this life. Remember what Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 10 said? It says, an excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. What that means is a good wife is hard to find. Their worth is far more than diamonds. And tonight's lesson is only an introduction of things we're going to be talking about. And we know that the marriage life is on attack. It's always been on attack since the beginning of time. The enemy doesn't like unity and marriage. And it's only an introduction tonight, amen. We'll be talking about marriage things. And I think this also would apply to single um, those that are not yet married, unmarried people. If you want to take a look around now and look at all the married people that are around you, that are in your life, that are in your, that are your friends, your coworkers, family, friends, brothers, sisters. Look around at them. Even grandparents. They've all had some trying times, yes? They've all gone through some challenges, every one of them. Amen. Many families and many homes today are not surviving. Many homes and families today are dying out. No one today is willing to fight for their marriages. They're not willing to make an effort. They're not willing to take it to God. They're not willing to come to the altar. They're not willing to dig into the Bible. They're not willing to stand on His Word. They're not willing to cry out for the sake of their marriage. Spouses only stay together because of their kids. Spouses only stay together because of their houses. Spouses only stay together because of their jobs or because of their money or what they've accumulated, their possessions. That's what marriage is. I see a lot of Marriages today, they're just stuck. They're stuck in a marriage. And they just accepted to be a dysfunctional home. They accept it to be a dysfunctional family. They just, ex a lot of homes I see, a lot of families I see, they've accepted abuse to be just a normal, a normal thing. Mental abuse is accepted. Physical abuse is accepted. Emotional abuse is taken as normal. Psychological abuse, we accept it as being normal, just a part of marriage. No communication, no talking among spouses. We gotta fight for our marriages. You gotta fight every day for your marriage. Amen. It can be successful. It can be a loving, powerful union. It can be a testimony. It can be proof that God 
is involved in your marriage. And there's, there's many stories in the Bible that we can look at. There are many marriage examples from the Bible. But, you know, every one of them that I, I've read about, none of them began with a romantic first encounter, a romantic first meeting. None of them. None of their marriages were like days filled with endless happiness and zero hardship. Every marriage in the Bible had challenges. These couples had to face so many obstacles together. That's the key, though. They were together when they made their marriages work. Although they had opposition and trial, trouble, hardship, everything. They had to fight for their marriages. These marriages in the Bible that we read of. There's, there's five marriages that I've looked up. These five marriages fought. These five spouses fought for their marriage. They went from being just an ordinary marriage to becoming an extraordinary marriage. As soon as they let God become involved in their marriage, things changed. When the man put, put himself in the right place where he should be, where the woman put herself in the right place where she should be. Look at Abraham and Sarah. Look at their marriage. Abraham and Sarah had moments Many moments of trouble when Abraham lied about Sarah and said that Sarah was his sister. And then when God told Sarah that you're going to have a, a child, a baby, what did Sarah do? She laughed at God. Sarah and Abraham didn't trust God with his promise. They didn't trust God. They couldn't wait for his promise. They took matters into their own hands and decided to have kids with uh, Sarah's maid, uh, Hagar. So in their marriage, their marriage teaches us that we shouldn't take matters into our own hands. We should not trust God with everything. Not trusting God. God for outcomes in our situations. They, their bad decisions are still seen today. Look in the Middle East. That's the descendants of Ishmael and Isaac. Another lesson to learn from these marriages or this marriage, Abraham and Sarah. Their bad choices and decisions translated down through the generations and even still today. So it is very important what we as spouses do. What we do, the bad choices and the bad decisions that we make in our marriage can be handed down to our kids and their grandkids and our great, great grandkids. It's proof right here. Abraham and Sarah them not trusting God, laughing at God, not taking God seriously. You can see the war still in their family. Right. Gomer, this is one that surprised me. I, I read it once like years ago and came across this one. Gomer and Hosea. This marriage, Gomer cheated on his Gomer cheated on Hosea numerous times. The Bible said that she had children for different men. She was unfaithful. Probably didn't love, obviously she didn't love Hosea. But the thing is, this was who God instructed Hosea to marry. A, an unfaithful what do you call it? A promiscuous woman. The Bible even describes her as like a prostitute. 
resist marriage teaches us that our spouses, although they may have done some horrible things and have a horrible past and they may have addictions and weaknesses and they probably failed so many times like Gomer did. What we take from this marriage is that we still need to love and forgive. Remember somewhere in the Bible it says, we'll get to that, divorce is not an option. That's a hard one to process. I was surprised at that one. Everyone messes up. But forgiving and moving forward is what will save a marriage. Forgiving and loving one another and fighting for your marriage is what will save a marriage. Another marriage, Esther and King Xerxes. This was in our Sunday school lesson a couple of months ago. Esther, remember the story about her? Esther. She, her marriage was, wasn't based on love. She didn't fall in love with this king. Their marriage was brought together uh, an arranged marriage. Esther was just chosen out of the hundreds of uh, females and she was the one chosen. You may have thought at one time in your marriage, this isn't the one I wanted. In your marriage, you're like, why did I get stuck with this? There's no love. This isn't the one I picked. I picked the wrong one. I can't love this. What's the right, proper word? I can't love this. What have you said? Idiot. I can't love this moron. Or <laughs> but it says their love and their respect grew for one another. It may be a questionable union sometimes with your spouse. You know, you have, of course, the enemy's going to influence you and throw all this stuff in your mind and you begin to believe it and you begin to not love, you begin to fall out of love with your spouse. Kind of like Esther and this king. There was no love there. There was impossible. There was no way. There was, it, this wasn't it. But when they got God involved, that all changed. It says they grew together in love and respect for one another. And we all know the end of that story. You remember how her whole family and the whole nation of Israel were saved from death because of their union. Their marriage had a purpose. God had a plan for their marriage. Amen. Even though it seemed unlikely and never going to work, but when God got involved, they didn't see it. They didn't know it. But God had plans to save the nation of Israel from being wiped out. One marriage saved the nation. One marriage saved a woman's family. Think about that. Amen. Another marriage in the Bible, Zacharias and uh, Elizabeth. These are uh, John the Baptist's parents. Zacharias, the Bible says, was a priest. But this priest doubted God. A priest doubting God in a marriage where he's supposed to be the one leading and be, have, have his priorities in order. Zacharias, the priest, doubted what the Lord told him. And because of that, the Lord caused him to become mute, shut his mouth. And their marriage shows us that one spouse that is overpowering in his ways, when one spouse says it's my way or no way at all, 
when they're mentally overpowering, when they're uh, The Bible says it takes two to stand together, yes? You both have to fight equally for your marriage. The 100 and 100% 100 involvement from each spouse. Fight equally for your, for your marriage, for your kids, for your grandkids. It's important what you do. It's important what you portray. It's important what kind of example you are. It's important how you walk. It's important your faithfulness. It's important how you present yourself to your kids, your family, and your marriage, and what you do to re respect your spouse. And the last one, Joseph and Mary. Imagine their argument. Imagine their frustration, Joseph and Mary. Imagine the worry in their marriage. Imagine the fear in their marriage because uh, here's Mary all of a sudden just got pregnant. And to tell Joseph that, I can only imagine what Joseph was like. What do you mean you're pregnant? I didn't even touch you. What are your Jewish families going to say? What's your Jewish father and mother going to say? We're, we're dead for sure. But also God had a plan. God always has a plan for every situation. What the devil meant for bad, God can turn it for good. Whatever bad relationship you may be going through, you may have right now where you... God always has a plan as long as we include God in our marriage, include Him in our home, include Him in our plans. And the way to include Him is to get rid of those things that shouldn't be there. Put Him in His rightful place. Therefore, after you've done all this stuff, cleaning up things in your life the way I've done, I've got, I've got rid of a ton of stuff in my life. That's when things begin to align in my life. In my relationship with my spouse, with God, everything began to fall into place. God had a plan. And look where I am today. I never thought in my life that I would be you know, doing what I'm doing, teaching. And teaching about marriage. <laughs> in the case of Joseph and Mary, they never dreamed what God had in store for them. They probably couldn't believe the plan God had for their marriage. To be, to, to have God Almighty's Son be born through Mary. What a plan for a marriage. And it happened through all this turmoil in Joseph and Mary, the worry, the fear, the pain. So this, and like I said, all these marriages, they, they had to fight for it. There was opposition. There was obstacles left and right. They had to endure. There was troubled times. There was confusing times. There was hurtful. There was doubting times. There was all different kinds of different things in all the marriages, but they end up working out, amen, because the Lord always had a plan as long as we, as long as we could include Him in our marriage, amen. I'm looking forward to next uh, Wednesday's lesson, that's when we start our lesson in, in Genesis chapter 3, we'll, we'll point out some issues that um, Adam and Eve had in their marriages, and I'm looking forward, so pray, pray about these lessons, and pray that the Lord would speak to your hearts and your situations and and I pray that you would apply them and use them. We can we can come up here and say, you know, point out things in your life and but not to give you a plan, not to give you ways on how to deal with it, not to give you tools and how to overcome it. That would be unfair. So hopefully these this word and these lessons will give you tools and weapons and a plan and an outline on how to attack the, the enemy coming against your 
your marriage because there is an all out attack on our marriages, especially our marriages, the apostolic man and the woman. We have an attack on our family and I can't let it trickle down into my kids. Amen. I've got to fight for my kids, my family, my home, everything. I think I'm safe because I've included God in my situation and in my circumstances. And I thank God that I thank God even today for giving me my wife that I have today who's strong and bold and who's willing to stand beside me and share the same faith and share the same trust that I have for God. And that's how marriages work. You've got to work together. It's not a, a 10 or a 100. It's, it takes both. A 100% hundred, a hundred involvement from both spouses. Amen. And... Um, and this book, I think I've already showed you, these lessons is where we're going to be taking. And to make copies of every one of these is a, I don't think our copy machine would handle something that big. So I think I'm, what I'm going to do is just go through and just condense and, and then just make copies. So I'll have copies next time. We, I have a ton of scripture that I'll be uh, handing out, paperwork out of our lesson book and, and the lessons that we've gone through prior to this on parenting and but I, I'm thankful for these lessons and I pray that God would use my mouth and my, my, my situation and my life and my example to share that with all of you. Amen. So that's all I have for tonight. Amen. Anybody else? Pastor, you want to say anything?